center of the picture I just left the ponderosa pine this is the uh, elk super highway here I'll rotate around and that's the area where I'm hoping to be when nature calls and then past that grassy gully over on this side is where, if that does happen, I will distribute some seeds that just have saliva on it from cracking the berries open as a control case. So here's a view. And here's the Elk Superhighway that runs along through here. couple deer I scared up straight on in the picture there. I'm zooming in. Not elk, deer. This is also a good place to pause on the side of the slope here because here you get to see looks like pretty much gamble oak. It'll be interesting those clumps of shrubs and then it's just too dry on top for anything um, down there. And after I cross, deer are still there just watching me. After I cross, it sure does look like my hypothesis that every single tree up there, most of them, are Rocky Mountain Juniper with a scattering of Ponderosa Pine. So we will see. Part way down the slope, and I decided to pause here. And when, whenever I see a sinkfoil bush, especially if there's several, um, the grasses get very thick in here. Uh, it must be much moister in here. See how thick these bunch grasses are. And here's here's the sinkfoil. Now that compares to the really moist sedges right in the bottom there. Uh, that's where water would actually be flowing on occasion. But as I look up slope here, the grasses change and uh, no more sink foil and it's, this is maximum dry in here. So here I'm just above the gully. You can see that darkest area is where the water sometimes runs and certainly stays for a while. All this brown, that would be the seed heads of the sedges. Sedges have edges and they're very silica rich, so you really won't see anything eating this, the sedges, though I bet the large mammals, Pleistocene mammals certainly did. We've just lost them. Um, so this is looking up the gully and I'm gonna head right up into there somewhere and explore those trees. One more pause here before I head up the hill. These tall leafy flat structures, these are irises, wild irises. Now I've, I've seen them a lot throughout this refuge, wherever you get into a moist area. But for some reason, I don't see any uh, I don't see any seed heads, heads here. They flower early and elsewhere I've seen the seed pods forming. But these are irises and I'm feeling a few drops of rain now. Very good. Heading up slope right now. South facing slope and so we've got a little Asteraceae daisy family in here, quite a few. Yellow clover, I am surprised that they're here. I wouldn't, these, that's its tall plants with the yellow. But look at up there, we've got some prairie kind of cone flower, also Asteraceae in there. 
none of those on the north facing slope. We have some lupin here, which we also had on the north facing slope. And here, this scraggly tree trying to hang in, by golly, that's a Rocky Mountain juniper. First full tree I encounter, Rocky Mountain juniper with some seeds in their second summer of growth. They'll ripen this year if you... I crunch through one and there's no seeds yet. These are the berries. It takes two summers to ripen. But this is a very healthy Rocky Mountain juniper. And here's the area I just came from, over in there. Ooh, see if I catch it. Here comes another deer bounding along. See it right in the center of the picture. Hey, that's where I want to put some alligators. Just pause for a second by the Rocky Mountain Juniper. This is the first of this cushion type plant I've seen. Don't know who that is. There's uh, another one here. Yep. Flowers, there's some are different, some are the same over here. Okay, so the gamble oak gets thick. I doubt if I'll find any elk trails through there, so I might have to, in fact, I think I will. I'll just go around to the right and then head into the forest from there when I see a trail. This is looking back at uh, the slope with the white firs. I was wrong. I had thought it was taller. It's not that much taller than the ridge I'm going up here, south facing slope. I think I was confusing it with that ridge there, which is definitely taller. So, very interesting. The ponderosa pines are thick and very tall up there. Very different from this south facing, south facing slope. go up there sometime. Probably go up by starting low on the ridge there and then following the ridge line up. But that's for another day. I'm approaching the summit of this uh, low part of the ridge. If I go much further I'll be on the north facing slope. But just to scan around here, this is scanning back to where I was today with the white fir and Douglas fir. And it seems to be true that everything over here is a gamble oak or a Rocky Mountain juniper. Don't even see any ponderosas right here. But as I turn around, look at this, the exception that proves the rule. A lone Douglas fir right there. Not very tall, but there it is. Doug fir with gamble oak. Still on the south facing slope. That's a really interesting little stream that you can see coming over from around the ridge that has a north facing and the white firs on it. But it's true, everything here is a gamble oak or a Rocky Mountain Juniper, and by golly, the junipers look really healthy here. 
so abundant. Now, one thing I want to mention so that nobody gets concerned that alligators I'm planting here might outcompete these gorgeous Rocky Mountain junipers. From the exact location where I got these alligators on the east side of Sandia, Rocky Mountain juniper and alligator juniper mix it up there. Uh, Rocky Mountains tend to be maybe 20 feet lower down towards into a ravine, but sometimes right next to each other. So I'm, I'm splicing in some video footage and photographs of my time there. But uh, here we have one kind of juniper, Rocky Mountain juniper, towards the southernmost part of its range. It goes way up into Canada. And so I see no harm at all for trying to introduce, inadvertently of course. I mean, after all, if, if you gotta take a poop, you gotta take boop. Uh, but introducing alligator junipers will not be a problem for them. I mean, the thing that we have to realize over, especially the Sky Islands area, is that whether a species gets back to an area after the glacial episodes uh, is really depends on whether a coyote or a bear walks far enough and the rodents don't scavenge the seeds out of the poop. You know, it's that random. We're going to have to be doing more of that as climate changes. Clements in the early part of the 20th century proposed ecosystems as kind of a self-contained unit with its own stability like an organism. And um, not long after that, that was basically disproved. And certainly the more we learn about paleoecology and how each of the trees marched north at a very different rate. Mostly not march, passenger pigeons, blue jays would carry the seeds the fastest. All right, let's continue exploring. I've moved quite a ways over onto the north-facing side of this hillock, and here's the second Douglas fir I've encountered. Again, we're north-facing, and what's surprising here is uh, it's not much of a slope. But this is also the spot, it looks like right on the peak, right there, center, that's the characteristic leaf form needles, three long needles of ponderosa pine. So let's go visit it. Yes, indeed. Slightly on the north side of the highest elevation on this ridge, north facing side, ponderosa pine. Now, facing north there, you can see the broad valley of the biggest grassland that there is very broad. Little Chimita Creek runs through there. But there's also, look at this, we got another Doug fir. Young, looks very happy. Heading up. A lot of gamble oak in here. Some grassy areas. Not quite the highest point, but here I've got a grassland where I can swivel. Straight in the center of the picture was where I spent most of the day today on that north facing slope. Gorgeous Rocky Mountain Juniper with blue hint with all the berries especially on it. More Rocky Mountain Juniper and Gamble Oak in the center. Here we've got two uh, Ponderosa Pines. Those are the two I just showed. Rocky Mountain Juniper on the left. And there you can see the grassland again. I think I'll head down here, Rocky Mountain Juniper on the right, head down slope. I think I can find my way through here. I also just want to be able to ensure that there's nothing but gambles and Rocky Mountain Juniper in there. And then I'll head over to uh, where I'm anticipating I might be fortunate enough to have nature call. Okay, I just crossed over that old log in the center. That would have been a ponderosa pine almost for sure. And uh, the wind's picking up. I hope I can be heard here because this is the first sign I've ever seen of charring. This certainly would have been, well, ponderosa pine. Somebody could look at it and see. But 
definitely, you wouldn't find a Rocky Mountain juniper that massive. And you can see the charred underside there. Hard to say whether the, it used to be charring on top and it's just sort of eroded and weathered away. But I would imagine this was a lightning strike you know, way up here. We're just about at the ridge top um, that had this tree go on fire and maybe not much else around it. But I have not seen any evidence of fire anywhere else. Uh, I don't get a sense that that the it's being managed to keep the grassland by fire. I just don't know how this works. If I find out, um, I'll let you know. Pausing for a moment here, beautiful uh, round rock I collected that would show there was some river rounding going on. But look at the golden, very golden in the center, same kind of rock, brownish off to the side. That's pure chert. And so whether there was a river or not, you, you never get rounding on chert. Uh, they're a very glassy silica type thing, that microcrystalline that forms in the ocean. And given the chert here, by golly, this would be a great place for indigenous people to have come to get good material for making arrows. Only thing better than this would be if they could uh, trade for obsidian somewhere. Obsidian's always better, though it's not quite as strong, but it's sharp. All right, chert. I'm almost down this very steep slope on the south facing side. I just want to stop here, a glorious Rocky Mountain juniper. But also there must be quite a water flow here because there's a little Douglas fir and a big Douglas fir right over there. I'm following the eroded surfaces here. I'll look back up. Here's the lower trunk of that biggest Doug fir and uh, I'm on a deer or elk superhighway heading down here, but there's quite a few uh, Doug fir young ones here. And then, of course, Rocky Mountain juniper mixed in. But we'll continue down this trail. The base of this Doug fir and a juniper behind. This is a beautiful, dusty, smooth area where somebody likes to hang out. Somebody else likes to hang out there. One of the ungulates, deer, elk, I would imagine deer, easily scoot down from here if need be. And this, let me see if I can get to it here. This is, I think, the biggest Rocky Mountain juniper I've seen. Look at that. Let me see, get in there. See that huge base in the background there? I'll move up, it kind of curves right there. But it is a the tallest, you see how they can get tall. Tallest, tallest, look at that, way up there. Oh, and there's another deer or elk sleeping zone right there. What a magnificent tree. Here's the first ponderosa pine I've seen coming down the slope on this steep south-facing slope. I'll rotate around here. Look at the beauty of just beautiful Rocky Mountain juniper. There's that big Rocky Mountain juniper that I just showed and the giant Douglas fir behind it. So I might need to swallow a few more seeds and come up here at some point. This is just a wonderful, wonderful location. All right, I'm going to continue heading, get down into the gully there, and then head over in that direction. Okay, those are the big trees I just came out of. I just came down the slope here, and I'm going to head over over to that slope in there. But here in the dry, I encountered a, a plant that I just hadn't seen anywhere else before. And uh, it's obviously died back, 
but it's got the kind of thorns on it that Japanese barberry has. I don't think it's a Japanese barberry, though I have seen Japanese barberry in Colorado. I'll go close. I have no idea. There's several specimens of it here. One here, young one, and then quite a few, kind of in a line right here. Anyway, many plants to learn. Hallelujah! Success! Again, I'm not sure if I'm going to use this, but uh, I moved it, I did it very near, moved it to either a deer or an elk poop. There's where I spent the afternoon over there with the white furs. Came across here. Success! Full of seeds. Right around in here and then I did the area between here, see that lowest tall ponderosa pine, nothing past there, right up above it. And then moving uphill, kind of in between from here, those set of, of white pine, or ponderosa pine. And then there's two stems back there, the tallest one has a white rock by it. Um, not quite up to there, but this is the area to look. If there's, of course there could be Rocky Mountain junipers. There was one really big Rocky Mountain juniper over in that area there. But mostly it's just, oh, <laughs> glory be, here's a Rocky Mountain juniper right here. So the only way to tell will be once it gets old enough as to whether I'm successful with Rocky Mountain or with alligator junipers. The only way to tell will be uh, when it gets old enough to have the alligator bark, and that's probably a good 15, 20 years. I will be dead almost surely by then. Somebody else will have to check. And of course their seeds are very different too on the female trees. Okay, so since this is a science experiment, trying to find out if it really makes sense to excrete the seeds, I'm now going to move shop over past this grassy gully in here, over to just below all those Rocky Mountain junipers over there, and I'm going to crack some dried berries in my mouth get the seeds, each of them out, and um, put them in about the same depth, anywhere from about a oh, quarter inch to about a half inch or so, mineral soil, but also buy some gamble oaks and also some good soil. I've just been trying a lot of different areas, so I'll do the same over here. Okay, I just finished planting the seeds from within 30 berries um, average of three, sometimes four a piece uh, that I just broke up in my mouth and made sure the seeds were separate from the husks. That area in the center of the picture is exactly the area where I had finished planting the seeds that had been in my second bit of excrement today. And so up here I'm at the highest where I went for, with the seeds of these 30. It was very easy to do. And I could see uh, small seeds, large seeds. It was very easy to see the differences here. Michael has joined me here. It's about 7 o'clock. We'll walk back to the house. And basically, well, let's see if I can see it from up here. Yeah, I think so. In the very center of the picture, you see in the middle of the grassland a shrub there. Uh, that's where I put my stick against. And then I just started up or across uh, in this direction and then up. So to find this place, a couple of Rocky Mountain junipers there. Let me do a twist in this direction. Got a big, big Rocky Mountain juniper right here. 
I'm in the midst of a whole bunch of gamble oak. And a Rocky Mountain juniper right here. And the last two seeds I put in um, right in this elk poop. This is not um, deer. This is elk. It's really big. Yeah, in fact, let me go down here and get scale. Yep. So it's elk poop, but Connie extra. I don't think so. Yeah, well, there you have it. So Michael said he actually, on his way up, he actually found some, he actually found some uh, water standing in a pool there. So a drinking, drinking hole down there. A drinking hole down there, yeah. All right, so I'll take a picture of the drinking hole. I'm sure that's where the deer and elk come rather than having to go across all the way across there and go down to the other side to get to the little chimita. They've got a place right here. So little baby alligators, I would normally say may the forest be with you, but you really like to be in the open. So what I will say, Maybe may the rain clouds be with you. Here's Michael's head. He's at the little drinking hole. Let's go find him. So here's the water hole. <laughs> See, it's even got water striders on it. Now, let's take a look at this thing. I've seen places that where ranchers have used bulldozers to make little stock ponds. See this here is, uh, there's where the gully runs into it here. I've never seen one like this. Now, it's possible that the old Spanish settlers here who preceded my ancestors, uh, mine were in 1640 on my father's side, <laughs> They, they were here a good 50 years before that. This is one of their strongholds. What a beautiful place, too. So if they ran cattle here, it's possible they used shovels and dug this out. And it's not like it's going to erode anything into it. I mean, look at those sedges. It's not like mud comes down through here in a downpour. And if it weren't, you know, the Spanish settlers here, well, maybe it was the mastodons. The mastodons that used to roam this area up until about 13,000 years ago. Who knows? And then the, uh, the elk and the buffalo kept it going. All right. So thank you, Michael Dowd, for pointing this out. Standing here, uh, that shrub right in the middle of the picture that's where I set my stack, and that's where I started on this last group of 30 berries. Just, just um, chewed, chewed apart in my mouth enough to get the seeds out. And then I kind of went up into that area, that area there. And so that's the control. And here's where the final seeds that pass through a human digestive system were put in. Now, unfortunately, it's not a perfect control. I was unthinking when I packed seeds today. I wanted to maximize the diversity. So, whichever one comes up better or comes up first or seems stronger, it could have something to do with the distinct genotypes rather than digestive system or no digestive system. And then up here, the first day, I strictly took the huge volume of seeds um, from the very first tree that Michael, it was actually Michael who found this, uh, the berries beneath. So three different genotypes. And then first thing this morning, I was way out 
to the end of where you see the trees on the right and then curved around to the right and went up so that it was truly a west-facing slope there. One more. There's a salamander in there. It's swimming near the surface. I don't want to disturb it. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, my God, look at that. Jeez. Oh, you can see the gills on the side of its of its head. Oh, it's pretty big. Look at it compared to those. I think, I wonder, I'll have to find out what the salamanders are up here. But that sure signifies, gosh, but then once they're through, where do they come out? What do they do? It's pretty, well, who knows? Yeah, there's the monster. I wonder what you're eating. Water striders don't seem to mind you. Yeah, Michael wants to see it too. You can make noise. Look at that. See it? Mm -hmm. Whoa. Whoa, it's got colors on it like green and red. Thank you, Salamander. Just one more thing. We are hiking downstream and uh, sip sink foil here, but look at a whole patch of milkweed. This is the first milkweed we've seen. And it's really quite large. This patch is so isolated, I haven't seen a single of those characteristic orange uh, milkweed beetles. Certainly no monarch butterfly caterpillars here. Pollinators, yes. Caterpillars, beetles, no. Continuing downstream and back to the refuge entrance and beyond that to where we're house sitting. Not so much downstream, down valley. Down valley, right.